أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدًا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون أما بعد One of the most important beliefs that the Quran came with that completely destroyed pre-Islamic beliefs one of the most revolutionary beliefs that the Quran came with that was at odds with the mainstream theology of pre-Islamic Arabia was the belief in life after death the belief that after we die, we're actually going to begin our full and eternal life. In fact, in some ways, in some ways, this belief was the most radical concept for the people of Arabia. Why? Because they believed in Allah overall. They believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but they also believed in other gods. So belief in Allah was not novel. It wasn't new for them. And of course, belief in a prophet, yes, it was different and difficult for them, but it didn't cause them the amount of antagonism or grief that believing in a hereafter caused them. And therefore, if you open the Quran and read it, you will be hard pressed to find a single page in which this concept is not mentioned over and over again. In fact, it is the primary theme of the majority of Meccan surahs. You will hardly find any Meccan surah except that belief in life after death 
is one of the fundamental aspects of this surah. عَمَّ يَتَسَأَلُونَ عَنِ النَّبَئِ الْعَظِيمِ أَلَّذِيُمْ فِي مُخْتَلِفُونَ What are they asking about? What are they differing about? They're differing about the grand event, which is the Day of Judgment. Allah says, أَإِذَا كُنَّا تُرَابًا أَإِنَّا لَفِي خَلْقٍ جَدِيدٍ Do you think once we are decayed, we're going to be resurrected? Allah says, وَأَقْسَمُوا بِاللَّهِ جَهْدَ أَيْمَانِهِمْ لَا يَبْعَثُ اللَّهُ مَنْ يَمُوتُ They swore the most powerful oaths. Allah is never going to resurrect the dead. Allah says, وَقَالُوا إِنْ هِيَ إِلَّا حَيَاتُنَا الدُّنْيَا نَمُوتُ وَنَحْيَا We only have one life to live. We're going to live, we're going to die, and nothing is going to cause us to be resurrected. They ridiculed the Day of Judgment. They questioned resurrection. They sarcastically asked, how can these feeble bones, these decayed flesh, how can you bring it back to life? They challenged Allah to bring about the Day of Judgment right here and now. Matasa'a, when is the Day of Judgment? And the Quran continuously addressed these challenges over and over again. In today's brief khutbah, brothers and sisters, I want to go back to this really basic pillar of our theology and to extract from the Quran five benefits. What happens when you believe in life after death? What happens when you believe in Qiyamah, in Jannah and Nar, in Ba'ath, in Hashar, in Hisab? Because we have to ask ourselves, why is this concept so central to our religion? Why is this concept such a pillar of the Quran? And the response, as we're going to see today, is that our beliefs in this aspect completely change our psyche. It completely impacts our actions, our philosophy of living, our attitude. And this is why you hear the phrase that aqidah is important, theology is important. Now, inshallah, today you will understand why. Theology is important, especially the fundamentals of Islamic theology. Because when you believe in life after death, when you believe in qiyamah, in jannah, in nar, in hisab, it will impact every facet of your existence, the way you will live, the way you will talk, the way you will act, your view on life, the way you view the world, everything will change. And that's why it's nice to go back to the basics. It's nice to refresh. Why do we believe what we believe? And what are some of the benefits of this type of belief? So today, because of time, we'll only mention five, but of course, much more can be extrapolated. What are some of the benefits of believing in life after death? And by the way, FYI, the majority of religions don't believe in life after death. It's actually something that is, in terms of religions, on the rare side. All of the far eastern religions, you know, Hinduism and, and Buddhism and whatnot, they don't believe in, you know, Qiyamah and life after death. Obviously, no paganist religion believes in life after death. And even the modern, you know, Jewish trend and faith, by and large, they don't really believe in Hisab and Qiyamah the way that uh, the rest of, you know, uh, religions do. Really, it's only two main faiths, Christianity and Islam, that believe in the types of resurrections that we are familiar with. Of course, put together, that makes more than 50% of mankind. But in terms of religions, it's really only the Abrahamic religions, and even amongst them, for some reason, you know, the Jewish faith has kind of withdrawn from this and they, they are questioning whether there is, there isn't. It's not really in their main priority. So this is therefore even more important that when we talk about Islam, preach Islam, we bring up this fundamental Quranic concept of life after death. What are some of the benefits, the thamarat, the fruits of believing in life after death? Point number one, when you believe in life after death, all of a sudden your life attains meaning. There is a reason for you to live. There's a reason for you to accomplish. There's a motivation for you to get up in the morning and do something. Can you imagine if there was no life after death? Can you imagine if there is no higher purpose to life? I mean, atheists who don't even believe in a God, much less afterlife. There is no God, there is no Qiyamah. What is the purpose of living? For them, the entire existence is accidental. It is literally as if randomly a bunch of atoms have come together for a fleeting millisecond in the grand scale of things only to be extinguished, consciousness gone forever once you die. What is the meaning of life then? What is the purpose of living? 
And even if they want to live, why accomplish something during your life if you don't believe in an afterlife? And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us, أَيَحْسَبُ الْإِنسَانُ أَنْ يُتْرَكَ السُّدَىٰ أَمْ حَسِبْتُمْ أَنَّمَا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ عَبَثًا Did you think we created you for no reason? There's no akhira, there's no jannah and nar. Did you think life was a joke? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَهُوَ الَّذِي يَبْدَأُ الْخَلْقَ ثُمَّ يُعِيدُهُ He created you the first time. He's going to recreate you all over again. One of the most fundamental questions of life is why is there life? And if you don't have an answer to this question, if you don't answer this question, then the rest of your life becomes meaningless. And you have to discover a reason for life that is not fulfilling, it's not satisfying. But when you know why you are created, when you know that this life is a stepping stone to the next life, all of a sudden you have a sense of higher purpose, a sense of nobility, a sense of motivation. Allah created me for a goal, for a wisdom. Can you imagine not having this? And every single human being, without exception, at some point in their lives, they wonder, what shall happen after death? What is going to happen to me when I'm no longer here? Everybody wonders about this question. It is only us who know with certainty what is going to happen after death. Nobody else can tell us this because nobody has come back from the dead to tell us. Only Allah can tell us and Allah Azza wa Jal has told us. And that's why when you don't know the Akhirah, your life becomes difficult, your life becomes troubled. And this is what Allah references in the Quran, even with regards to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. وَوَجَدَكَ ضَالًّا فَهَدَى we found you not knowing everything. You weren't upon guidance and we guided you. Allah says in the Quran, مَا كُنْتَ تَدْرِي مَا الْكِتَابُ وَلَا الْإِيمَانِ You didn't know what was belief until Allah revealed the Quran. You see, logically, rationally, you can deduce the existence of God. Even rationally, you can deduce the existence of God. But rationally, you cannot deduce the day of judgment. Rationally, you cannot think about a life after death. This must be told to you from ghaybiyat, from iman bil ghayb. And that is why the Quran is so adamant. It wants to keep on telling you because the only way to know there's life after death is because the creator of life and death has told you there's life after death. Otherwise, you would never know that there's life after death. So the Quran makes it a central pillar of its message, its theology, to know the purpose of life. Point number two, when you believe in Hisab, when you believe in Qiyamah, when you believe in life after death, all of a sudden, you will live a life of a better standard, higher self-discipline, your ethics, your interactions, your moral compass, your sense of accountability will be at an all-time high. And that is because when you don't believe in a hereafter, when you have no higher purpose, well then, for how long will you be motivated to be righteous? For how long will you live ethical lives? The minute that you might do something that is unethical and get away with it, for you, if you have no higher purpose, you will go ahead and do this. But when you believe in an akhirah, when you believe that everything you do is going to come back to haunt you, when you believe your status in the hereafter is going to be judged by your status in this life, all of a sudden, your standard of ethical living, your morality, your honesty, your avoiding evils, your avoiding injustice, your living ethical lives, it will be at an all-time high. And can you imagine if every human being remembered that I have to answer for what I do. How will society change? Belief in an akhirah actually brings about a reduction in the sins of society. Belief in an akhirah reduces many problems that are rampant in societies that don't believe in an akhirah. When you believe in an akhirah, generosity goes up, helping the poor goes up, crime should go down. All of this is causally related because when you have to answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, automatically you have a a personal internal conscience when nobody's watching you you know Allah is gonna call you to Hisab so you live a pure and better life and that's why we are constantly reminded that you're going to be asked about what you have done let us then you're going to be asked about what you have done our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said every one of you is a shepherd and every one of you is gonna have to account for his flock Every one of you is a shepherd. You're going to have to account for your flock. Our Prophet ﷺ said, on the day of judgment, your two feet will not move. 
until you are asked about your time, your wealth, your health, what you did with what Allah has blessed you with, you know there is a hisab. A person will have to have account, and that's why we call it a hisab. If you know the IRS is coming for you, you're going to make sure you do your taxes 100%. Well then, we know Allah is going to have a hisab. We're going to make sure we live better lives. Therefore, one of the main benefits, one of the main perks of believing in an akhirah is that automatically the quality of your life in terms of morality, in terms of even societal standards is going to increase. The third benefit of believing in an akhirah is that when you believe in life after death, it brings a sense of optimism in difficult times. It brings a sense of the light is at the end of the tunnel, no matter how dark the tunnel is, no matter how difficult life is today, tomorrow it's going to be better. Because this world, we all know, it is a world of pain, a world of suffering, a world of anxiety, a world of stress, a world of one loss after another, one tragedy after another. You lose a loved one, and when there's no life in the hereafter, when there's no akhirah, how do you overcome the loss of a loved one whom you really loved? Well then, when you believe in an akhirah, the pain doesn't go away. It's not as if you no longer feel any pain, but you get a sense of consolation that, you know what? This loss is temporary. Whoever I've lost, inshallah, in the akhirah, I'll be with them forever. Whatever tragedy I've suffered, whatever pain, whatever cancer, whatever sickness, whatever, you know, a, a financial loss, inshallah, in the next life, there's going to be something better for me. Now, when you take away life in the hereafter, when you no longer believe in an akhirah and this dunya becomes your only dunya, well then, when you don't get what you want, when pain and suffering comes, you have no mechanism to cope with that pain and suffering. And therefore, depression, suicide, all of this is going to be on the rise when you don't believe in an akhirah. And that's exactly what we see in the world around us. And this isn't just theology. It's not just something that I'm saying as a, as a theologian. This is something that is tangible. It is measurable. In fact, there's an article, a landmark uh, article that was published in the Journal of Nervous and Mental Diseases under the title, this is the title of the journal article, Belief in Life After Death and Its Relationship with Mental Health. And in this survey, in this, in this, you know, it's a proper academic article, a number of scientists, psychiatrists, sociologists studied the lives of over 1,500 uh, people in this country. Over 1,500 people were studied and surveyed. Correlation between Iman and Akhirah, whether they're Muslim or Christian, and between quality of life. And this article concludes, it says, and I quote, that they're going to measure six key aspects, anxiety, depression, Obsession, compulsion, paranoia, phobia, somatization. These six things, they're going to measure and correlate with Iman and Akhirah. And they concluded, the results confirmed, I'm quoting from the article, that belief in life after death was significantly associated with lower symptom levels on all six psychiatric symptom clusters, end quote. All six of these aspects, paranoia, obsession, compulsion, depression, anxiety, phobia, all six of them. If you believed in the Akhirah, sociologists and psychiatrists have measured that it actually makes life easier to live. Subhanallah, we don't need them to prove this, but it's actually a fact that having a sense of full justice that inshallah in the next life I will get what has been deprived of me. This is something that brings a sense of peace to us. And this leads me to my fourth point from this. And that is the sense of zulm and injustice. That one of the problems of this world is that you don't get perfect justice. You don't get reckoning. It seems that sometimes unethical people live better lives than you. And you who are trying to be ethical, honest, you who are trying to do good, for some reason, maybe people take advantage of you. Maybe you have gotten the short end of the stick. Maybe the penal system in this country or any country does you wrong. Maybe there are people that are in jail, they shouldn't be in jail. Look at what is happening globally. So many, you know, lands and situations, our Palestinian brothers and sisters in Kashmir, the Burma, Uyghur, we can go on and on. Where is their justice? How, it doesn't seem to be fair. 
around the world, even in our Muslim lands, you have tyrants in charge and righteous scholars are jailed up simply for speaking truth to power, simply for preaching morality. Good men and women, innocent people are locked up simply for saying the kalima. Where is their justice? If you didn't believe in an akhirah, wallahi, life would be depressing. If you didn't believe in yawm al-hisab, yawm al-qiyamah, yawm al deen literally the day of resurrection and the day of recompense, how would you find peace in an otherwise very, very unpeaceful world? And this is why Allah Azza wa Jal literally links the akhirah with justice. This is a key point of the Quran. Justice and lack of justice in this world is one of the reasons why there must be an akhirah. Otherwise, how would you possibly, how could you not go crazy, especially when dhulm might be done on your people, on your family, on yourself? What will give you the sabr and the patience? Allah says in the Quran, Am naj'alul musidina kal mujrimin? Do you think that we're, that we're gonna make the righteous like the wicked? What is the matter with you? How are you judging? Allah says in the Quran, Am naj'alul ladhina amanu wa aminu salihati kal mufsidina fil ard? Am naj'alul muttaqina kal fujjar? Do you think we're gonna make the muttaqi like the fajr? Do you think we're gonna make the one who does good and the one who does evil the same? Malakum, what's the matter with you? How can you believe this to be the case? So when you believe in judgment day, that is the day justice is going to be enacted. That is the day every tyrant, that is the day every tyrant is going to regret the tyranny. And you know, in this world, even if you get partial justice, you will never get full justice. Suppose, suppose we find a tyrant and the United Nations Supreme Court, whatever it is, you know, they take this tyrant and they put him on jail, maybe even life sentence, maybe even execution. This tyrant has killed a million people in his own country. Let's say one example. A million people have been killed. So what if he goes to jail? So what if you execute him? How is that justice for that million people? You need an akhirah. You need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You need maliki yawmiddin to bring about ultimate closure and ultimate sense of justice. And therefore, this leads us to our fourth point that when you believe in an akhirah, you can look forward to justice in the next life and it will bring peace in this life. The fifth and final point, brothers and sisters, that also helps us to cope with this world. And by the way, all of these five blessings, I purposely chose blessings of this world of course in the akhirah there's going to be infinite blessings but i wanted to demonstrate when you have true belief in allah in the quran in the sunnah your life becomes better to live and your akhirah will of course be better to live allah will give you this world and the next everything of our religion every aspect of our religion will make you happier in this life and also in the next life the fifth and final point when you believe in an akhirah, you believe in Jannah, you believe in Qiyamah, you believe in Allah's reward. Well then, living in this dunya where you might not get everything that you want, where you have to control your pleasures, where people might have things you want and they might get them unethically. And there's no doubt if you don't believe in an akhirah, you're going to get a sense of rage like how come i don't have that type of house that type of car how come you know she's so beautiful or he's so famous it's not fair i want to live that type of lifestyle i want to have all of these luxuries and when you don't believe in an akhirah life itself becomes full of jealousy full of pettiness full of the rat race when you have no higher goal your goal becomes the right here and now and when it becomes the here and now, you're never happy with what you have because you always look at the bigger house or the bigger bank account or the more fame. But when you believe in the akhirah, all of a sudden you realize, you know what, this dunya is temporary anyway. What I have, I have. What I don't have, I don't have. And I have something to look forward to in the hereafter. Once again, Allah brings this point explicitly in the Quran. Don't look at what we have given these people that you might be tempted by. Don't look at that. Allah's reward is better for you. Allah's reward is everlasting. Notice, Allah links jealousies that might come, greed that might come. Allah says, don't be greedy. What I have ready for you is better than anything of this world. Can you imagine if greed is eliminated, jealousy is eliminated, and so what you have, you enjoy. 
What you have, you're happy with. And what you don't have, inshallah, I'll get it in the hereafter. This positive attitude, Allah says in the akhirah, that will have bigger blessings than anything of this world. Allah literally links the pleasures of this world. Allah links the good food of this world, the good clothes of this world. Allah says it is halal. I'm not saying it's haram. Allah says so. Then Allah says, but what is in the akhirah is better. What is in the akhirah is permanent. And so when you have this philosophy, you're never going to be full of jealousy. You're never going to be full of pettiness. You're never going to get involved in the rat race. What you have is going to make you content. Can you imagine being content with what you have that is the ultimate happiness so brothers and sisters all of these simple points tell us when you believe in Islamic theology when you believe in the Quran when you believe in the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala life itself becomes meaningful life itself becomes easier to live you can cope with depression you can cope with anger you can cope with the injustice not this is not to be fatalist but inside of you you realize you know what there is something going to take place in the hereafter that will bring about a sense of peace that I can never have now brothers and sisters it is mentioned that one of the leaders of the Quraysh, some say it is Umayyah bin Khalaf, some say others' names. They came to the Prophet Sallallahu and they had the bone of a camel in front of them. And that bone was crumbling. And they crumbled this bone. And he said to the Prophet Sallallahu mocking him, he said, Do you really want me to believe that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala can resurrect this bone once it has become dust? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the ending of Surah Yaseen. That, أَوَلَمْ يَرَ الْإِنسَانُ أَنَّا خَلَقْنَاهُ مِن نُطْفَةٍ فَإِذَا هُوَ خَصِيمٌ مُّبِينٌ Don't, doesn't man see that we created him from a mixture of fluids? And still, when he is created, he becomes arrogant, challenging us. And they argue with us. Even as they forget, we created him. They argue with us and they say, who is going to resurrect this decayed bone? قُلْ يُحْيِيهَا الَّذِي أَنْشَأَهَا أَوَّلَ مَرَّةً Respond, Ya Rasulullah, the one who created the bone and nourished it the first time, that one will bring it back again. For indeed, he has perfect knowledge of every creation. الَّذِي جَعَلَ لَكُمْ مِنَ الشَّجَرِ الْأَخْضَرِ نَارًا The one who can bring from the green tree, he can create fire for you. Will you not reflect? The one who created the heavens and earth, can he not resurrect these dead? Of course, بَلَى and indeed, he is the khalaq and the alim. All Allah has to say is kun. And indeed, it takes place. Brothers and sisters, belief in the Quranic theology is a belief that brings comfort to our lives. It, it is a belief that changes our entire paradigm. And it is a belief that will bring about salvation on the day of judgment. May Allah bless me and you with and through the Quran. And may he make us of those who its verses and they understand. And apply its halal and haram throughout our lifespan. I ask Allah's forgiveness. You as well ask him for is the ghafoor and the rahman. الحمد لله الواحد الأحد الصمد الذي لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد وبعده. Perhaps some of you have heard of the tragedy that took place a few days ago here in our city of Dallas, where um, very sad news that a certain brother uh, became angry in a domestic violence um, case and murdered his wife. Allah Musta'an la ilaha illallah la hawla qutula billah. And uh, the three or four children, the four children then became orphans. He was put into jail. We prayed the janazah for her here in this masjid a few days ago. And the four children, because there's no immediate relatives, the four children have been taken into the uh, foster care system. And we don't know in all likelihood they will be given to uh, non-Muslim families. Uh, Insha'Allah, we're going to be giving multiple khutbas about domestic violence. But because this just happened this week, and we pray janazah right here in this masjid over uh, our sister, may Allah Azza wa Jal uh, accept her shahada and grant her firdaus. It is imperative that we just pause for a second and reflect about our own realities. So much can be said and will be said, inshallah. We'll have specific seminars for this topic in the upcoming months. But first and foremost, one millisecond of anger changes an entire life of six people. One millisecond of anger. La hawla wa la quwta illa billah. Be careful, brothers and sisters. Be careful of acting in a fit of rage. Our Prophet told us, anger is from shaitan. Al-ghadabu min shaitan 
When you feel angry, say A'udhu Billah, say Bismillah, do Wudu, sit down, don't act, don't talk. Second point, we've given khutbas about this, we'll give seminars more about this. The sad taboo of domestic violence. You know, we are taught when you see something, say something. We're taught this about terrorism, what not. We need to start applying this within our communities and families. I speak bluntly and loudly and clearly. Every one of you in this audience is responsible for your immediate circle of family and friends, acquaintances and relatives. If you know your cousin, if you know your brother, if you know your immediate friend is abusing his or her spouse, and it's a two-way street. Yes, the majority of abusers are men without a doubt, but sometimes it is the women physically abusing the men. It's a two-way street. It happens on both ways. If you know somebody that is being abused in your own circle, do not stay quiet, intervene, get involved. And if need be, if it is life-threatening, how can you not call the police to prevent something like this? Brothers and sisters, fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Four innocent young children are now in the foster care system. In all likelihood, they're going to be raised by non-Muslims. What can be said here? Monitor and be aware of what is happening in your own circle. Do not tolerate domestic violence. The third point, if you yourself are having issues with marriage, if you yourself are having you know, marital disputes, do not trivialize solving those problems before they get to a level, I mean, this is obviously extreme, but even less than this. There's nothing wrong with counseling. It's not taboo. You know, in our cultures of back home, in our cultures of our elders, we would think that, you know, these types of psychiatrists, these types of therapists, this is not for normal people. You know, we, have, we now know it is meant for normal people. We now know this is nothing. There should be no taboo about getting therapy, about going to a marriage counselor, about figuring out what is going on, bringing in the Quran references a type of counseling. Allah Azza wa Jal explicitly says if the two of them are about to divorce, let everyone reach out to an elder, let everyone reach out to a hakam, a judge, and let them all come together. Spill all the beans. Be very frank in this private gathering. What is happening? Why is there dispute? And then try to resolve the problem internally before something like this happens. Brothers and sisters, as a community, we have to raise the bar. And the final point, last night we invited a family lawyer and uh, she explained to us the reality that as soon as something like this happens and the Muslim children get into the foster system, the, the courts have no time, no luxury to wait 10 months. They have to go immediately to the first family available, a family that is already registered to adopt children. These are foster families. And unfortunately, in our culture and our faith communities, by and large, we don't get involved in the system. Because we don't get involved in the system, I mean, you can't really blame the courts. These are four kids. What are you going to do with them? They need a house. They're going to go to the first family that can take them. If they can't take all four, they're going to separate the kids into different families. And the fact of the matter, 99.99% .99 of the people on that list are not from a Muslim background, which means we need to raise the bar. So yesterday we invited the lawyer. She told us what needs to be done. You need to register with the family services. You need to make a phone call, you know, fill out a form. It doesn't cost any money. It costs minimal amount of time such that may Allah protect all. And sometimes it's not even a, 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 an accident. It could be a, an, a, a tragedy, a car accident, let's say. It doesn't have to be a murder. Sometimes things happen and there's no family. There are Muslim children involved. So what I'm asking those of you who are able to financially and marital wise and stability wise if you're able to register yourself and you have the right to say i want people from my ethnic background i want people from my faith community you have that right and once that may allah protect any family but once that happens we want muslim couples to be on that list we don't have Muslim couples on that list. And so unfortunately, these four kids, in all likelihood, we are not certain and there's confidentiality, but realistically, we spoke to the you know, people, we, there are no Muslims on this list. That's the problem. It's not that the government is being, no, what are you going to do when there's no Muslim families that want to take care of Muslim kids? It's not anybody else's fault. It's our fault. So that's why in the khutbah, I am raising this public awareness that not just anger management, not just you know uh, domestic violence and therapy, but also we need to collect 
collectively take charge of our community. So please, sisters and brothers, husbands and wives, talk to each other. If you're able to have a sponsor, have a child, a foster child, you know, of our background, then go through the process, call up the necessary phone calls. They'll come and visit you, fill out the forms, and have your name on the emergency list. If anything like this happens, we want them to come to a Muslim family, be raised by a Muslim couple. This is fard kifaya on all of us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect all of us from ever having to see something like this again. Allahumma inni da'in fa'aminu. Allahumma la ta'ala fi hadhi yawmi dhamban illa ghafarta. Wa la hamman illa farrajta. Wa la daynan illa qadayta. Wa la maridan illa shafayta. Wa la asiran illa yassarta. Allahumma ghafir lana wa li ikhwanina ladhina sabakuna bil iman. Wa la taj'a fi qulubina ghillan lillatina amanu. Rabbana innaka raufur rahim. اللهم أعز الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم أعز الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم من أرادنا أو أراد الإسلام والمسلمين بسوء فاشغله بنفسه واجعل تدميره في تدبيره يا قوي يا عزيز عباد الله إن الله تعالى أمركم بأمر بدأ به بنفسه وثنى بملائكة قدسه وثلث بكم أيها المؤمنون من جنه وإنسه فقال عز من قائل عليما إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلم تسليما اللهم صل وسلم وبارك وأنعم على عبدك ورسولك محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين عباد الله إن الله تعالى يأمر بالعدل والإحسان ويتأيد القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعذكم لعلكم تذكرون أذكر الله العظيم يذكركم واشكروه يزد لكم ونذكر الله تعالى أكبر وأقم الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله استو straighten your rose leave no gaps in the line الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين أولم يروا أنا خلقنا لهم مما عملت أيدينا أنعاما فهم لها مالكون وذللناها لهم فمنها ركوبهم ومنها يأكلون ولهم فيها منافع ومشارب أفلا يشكرون واتخذوا من دون الله آلهة لعلهم ينصرون لا يستطيعون نصرهم وهم لهم جند محضرون فلا يحزنك قولهم إنا نعلم ما يسرون وما يعلنون الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله 
Allahu Ekber Allahu Ekber الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين أولم ير الإنسان أنا خلقناه من نطفة فإذا هو خصيم مبين وضرب لنا مثلا ونسي خلقه قال من يحيي العظام وهي رميم قل يحييها الذي أنشأها أول مرة وهو بكل خلق عليم الذي جعل لكم من الشجر الأخضر نارا فإذا أنتم منه توقدون أوليس الذي خلق السماوات والأرض بقادر على أن يخلق مثلهم بلى وهو الخلاق العليم إنما أمره إذا أراد شيئا أن يقول له أن يقول له كن فيكون فسبحان الذي بيده ملكوت كل شيء وإليه ترجعون الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله 